In our last episode, we finally found the corpse of our mentor, Natasha Hunt, in the ruins of Lewisburg. She had been ambushed and assassinated by raiders who knew she was coming. A raider boss named Brody was the one responsible for setting up the ambush, but how did they know she was coming? On her corpse, we found her login credentials, and so we logged into Cryptos and used her credentials to promote our user account. We are now a novice of mysteries, and we were able to craft the garb of mysteries from the fabricator. But there are still a few pieces left to the Mistress of Mystery Regalia, the Phantom Device, the Blade of Bastet, and the Voice of Set. We must log back into Cryptos to learn where we can get these items. Logging again into our own user account, we can choose Mission Board. You may select from the following missions. We'll start from the top, the Phantom Device. With that, we get holotape instructions. We start the quest Chasing Shadows, and we have to listen to the holotape in our inventory. First and foremost, the Mistress of Mystery was a master of stealth, subterfuge, and infiltration. Your own talent and training are essential. But there were times when even the mistress needed more. Part smoke bomb, part cloaking field. The phantom device threw her foes into disarray while she made her most daring escapes. Frederick has found a way to make a real phantom device, but it requires two components we have in short supply. Search Cryptos for leads on stealth boys and hallucinogen gas. Use your training to infiltrate your targets, secure the items, and return them to the production facility. Good luck, dear. And be careful. We'll work on the Blade of Bastet and the Voice of Set in a minute, but for now let's focus on the Phantom Device. We can get a Stealth Boy and a Hallucigen Gas Canister in many different locations. It doesn't matter where we pick them up. In this example, I didn't have to run off and get a Stealth Boy because I found one next to Carrie's corpse on the rooftop gardens of Lewisburg. But if we don't have a Stealth Boy or a Hallucigen Gas Canister, we can log into Cryptos to see if it can track one down for us in the ruins of West Virginia. Logging into our user account, we'll go to Database Queries. This was blank while we were an initiate, but now that we're in office, we find many more options. We'll start by querying about phantom device components. Mission log number 822 indicates that a stealth boy may be in the possession of the raiders at North Cutthroat Camp. Searching database for hallucinogen gas done. Pre-war sales records indicate that hallucinogen gas may be found at the Garahan Mining Headquarters. Please acquire the components and return them to the production facility for processing. Now you saw the quest objective to get a stealth boy complete itself because I already had one in my inventory, but for the sake of being complete, we'll head to the North Cutthroat Camp so I can show you where to find it. To get there, we'll fast travel to the Pleasant Valley train station. This is right next to Top of the World and the nearby Ski Lodge, which we'll explore in depth in an upcoming video. The train station is a great place to visit. It not only has a responder merchant, but here, as with all train stations, we can access our stash, purchase from vending machines, including an ammo vending machine and a first aid vending machine, and there are plenty of workstations to use to break down our scrap. But to find the North Cutthroat camp, we take the train tracks north. Soon we see a ruined road off to the east. Moving to the road, we can continue north. Eventually, we see a ruined blue truck and the remnants of what was once clearly a raider camp. But it looks like now it is swarming with mole miners. Taking aim. Oh, come on, David. All right, you little looky-loo. Trying to shoot a video here. Hi. Yes, okay, I see you too. Heart, love, thank you. Oh, another one. Hi, Chaos Bringer. Well, you just wanted to appear in a video today, didn't you? Okay, salute you too. All right, back to my video. Crawling down the hill, we can creep closer. The mole miners are congregated together. A perfect target for grenades, but I didn't have any. Oh. 
these mole miners are excellent enemies to kill to farm for black titanium. Black titanium, which is an ingredient we need for a very special suit of power armor, which I'll tackle when I start my series on the quest Miner Miracles. Hopping into the back of the blue truck, we see that it was delivering parts for telephone poles, and back here we find a tool chest with scrap. The main part of the camp is on the western side of the road. Here I found the plans for domestic tables on a domestic table and the corpse of a raider on a couch. In a display case nearby, we find a spiked lead pipe mod and some ammunition. There's Nuka-Cola laying out on a shelf. And to the southeast, we find more bookshelves with water, bobby pins, a skill zero locked footlocker, stacks of ammunition and beer, and a tinkerer's workbench. Not a bad place to hit. Near to this, we find a tea table with two decapitated heads having tea. Gotta love that raider sense of humor. And next to this is a red end of dungeon steamer trunk. The Final 76 official strategy guide says that we find the stealth boy in this trunk, but you don't see it here because as I said earlier, I already had one. Moving northwest of here, we find a cooking station for cooking up all our meat and vegetables before they expire. And at the far northern end of the camp in the middle of the road, we find another raider corpse with ski poles all over the floor. There's a table at the base of a guard post with a skill level one locked ammo canister. At the top of the guard station, we find a ski sword. These ski swords are excellent melee weapons early and mid game. After looting scrap at the other guard station, we find a chem box to the northeast, a couple of heads in a shopping cart, and some thankfully empty bathtubs. And just as I was about to leave, I noticed a hut. How did I miss that earlier? There's some cutthroat raider graffiti on the side. We'll learn exactly where they got their logo in an upcoming video, but heading back to the hut, we can take the stairs to the very top where we find a third raider corpse. Here we can sleep in the sleeping bag and loot ammo from the ammo box. Just north beyond the camp, we see a bit of a firing range they had at one time set up, and all we find in the back of one of the trucks is a tool case. So, part one of the phantom device found. We now need to track down part two. And this sends us far south to the Garahan Mining Company's headquarters. Now, this headquarters is a central location for the side quest Miner Miracles, and it's chock full of interesting lore. I can't wait to tell the story of the Garahan Mining Company and their bitter rival, Hornwright Industries, but I'm gonna have to save that story for another day. So instead of going through the entire facility, we'll race into the lobby, down the escalator, and into the mining atrium. On the other side, we find ourselves on a balcony where we have to kill some Liberator robots. On the ground floor, we continue south, open the big sliding doors, past the Nuka-Cola machine to the CEO's office. Our quest indicator is pointing us towards a locked safe. It's skill level two locked, and if we can't pick it, we can always hack into the CEO's terminal, which is skill level zero locked. Inside, we can read a bunch of wonderful lore, which again, sadly, I have to skip for right now, but at the very end, we find safe control. Toggling safe control, we can back out, loot a luck bobblehead on a nearby shelf, kill some more liberators, and then loot the hallucinogen gas canister from the safe. We now have everything we need to make the phantom device. So. Heading back to Riverside Manor, we can rush to the Pulowski Preservation Shelter Elevators, take it down to the secret lair, hop out of our power armor, run through the laser grid, and head to Frederick's lab. Then, activating the fabricator terminal, we can navigate to fabrication services, and now choose the phantom device. And with that, we get the phantom device added to the aid section of our inventory. It looks just like a stealth boy, but the description says frenzies nearby creatures and renders you almost completely invisible. The best way to use the phantom device is to favorite it and bind it to a key. Then when in combat, if you feel like you're just overwhelmed, if they're swarming all around you and you have no way out, you can pop a phantom device. <laughs>
The phantom device generates a black cloud that confuses and frenzies the mole miners and other enemies, of course. It also turns you invisible, giving you the opportunity to quickly slink away. While the enemies are frenzied, they do attack each other. Though I found that the frenzy effect didn't last very long. The cloud quickly dissipates. I didn't see any of these mole miners kill each other. The stealth effect of the phantom device works about as long as the duration of a typical stealth boy. Stealth boys and hallucinogen gas canisters don't exactly grow on trees, but they're also not impossible to find. Over the course of your gameplay, you will stumble upon quite a few of each. So the phantom device is a viable tool to work into your character build. Back at HQ, we can access the mission board to download the Blade of Bastet holotape. We can then listen to it with our Pip-Boy. In combat, the Mistress of Mystery relied upon her speed, agility, and training in the martial arts, including the art of the sword. For many years, her favorite weapon was the Blade of Bastet, a legendary sword passed down from hero to hero across the ages. The time has come for you to earn your own blade. First, you'll need to locate a sword with historic significance. That symbolism matters. You'll treat it with respect. Cryptos should have some leads. Then you'll need to pick up one of Frederick's swing analyzers and attach it to your sword. The analyzer will collect data on your stance and swing as you wield it against different foes. Once the analyzer has finished its work, Frederick should be able to hone your sword into a blade worthy of the Mistress of Mystery. With that, we begin the quest Forging a Legend. We now have to find some sort of legendary or ancient sword to use as a base from which we can craft the Blade of Bastet. And so we will again log into Kryptos to see if Kryptos knows where we can find a suitable sword. Logging into database queries, we can have Kryptos search for historic swords. Pre-war archives indicate that a historic sword may be found in White Spring Presidential Cottage. Please acquire the sword, complete the swing analyzer process, and return it to the production facility for processing. The White Spring Presidential Cottage. But first, we need to use the fabricator to craft a swing analyzer. Logging in, we can scroll down to Novice Swing Analyzer. and the fabricator makes it for us. We find it in our inventory in the mods section. This is a melee weapon mod. We'll attach it to our Blade of Bastet after we forge it. Crypto said it located an historic sword at the White Spring Resort, and so we'll travel to the center of the map. Now, the White Spring Resort is an important location for the primary quest, and it's sprawling, chock full of buildings to explore and lore to consume. We'll save exploring the primary resort for when we do our series on the full story of the primary plot. For now, all we have to do is find the Presidential Cottage. We'll explore all of the lore we find there. We find the White Spring Resort by taking the 83A east of Riverside Manor. Then we take 63A north to reach the resort. Along the way, we'll start daily quests, events, and it's likely we'll find many other players here. We'll pass the primary resort on the right, the White Spring Golf Club on the left, which we'll explore in another video, and we bump right into a death claw. With the death claw dead, we can follow the road north, which bends to the northwest and goes around the resort. At the top of this hill, we find a bunch of private cabins and artisan shops. Starting on the southern side, we'll head up the stairs and explore the first room on the left. After killing the ghoul, we find a first aid kit behind the counter and a bunch of ceramic on display. This must have been a vase collectible display shop. We can move into the next shop through a hole in the northeastern wall. Here we can take care of another ghoul and pick a skill level three locked wall safe, which I didn't have at the time. This was a clothing shop. We find a sewing machine and items of clothing scattered around. Back on the landing, we can continue northeast to the next shop. This was a Christmas-themed shop. 
We can loot a Giddy Up Buttercup on the ground for the springs, very important. And against the northwestern wall are a bunch of toys, including board games, great for nuclear material and even more springs. But it's just then that we find another ghoul. On the shelf behind the counter is a violin. It doesn't really do anything, it's just a collectible prop. And we can move into the next shop through a hole in the wall to the northeast. This was a framed art shop. We don't find any saves, but we do find a duffel bag hiding behind a painting. This connects to the next shop through yet another hole in the northeastern wall. This was um, a bait and tackle or hunting shop. We find a fisherman's hat, some antlers lying out, but not a lot of scrap just interesting decorations. So heading out and continuing northeast, we can kill some more ghouls and then explore the final shop on this level. This was a nursery or flower shop, Annette's Arrangements. There's a cooler behind the counter and a skill level one locked wooden crate by some of the planters. And that's it for this level. So back to the landing, we can head up the stairs to kill more ghouls. And this brings us from the artisan shops to the private cottages. These cottages were protected by hand scanners, but the hand scanner on this cottage has been broken, as have the windows. Heading inside, we can move into the big formal dining room. It's still beautifully appointed, even all these years later, and we find the historic sword in a display cabinet next to a terminal. It looks like a Chinese officer's sword. Perhaps we can gain access by activating the terminal. This is the Presidential Cottage and Museum Terminal. The White Spring Presidential Cottage and Museum. The Appalachian White House. Open seasonally 9 a.m. to 4 p.m. Guided tours available upon request. In the first one about the cottage, with its commanding view of the North Lawn and Spring House, the Presidential Cottage is the White Spring's finest accommodation. The current cottage has hosted 12 of the 31 sitting or former presidents who have been guests of the resort and is available exclusively for their reservation. When not occupied, the cottage is open to the public seasonally April through November as a museum and historic site. Okay, so it was a museum. I wonder then whose sword is in the case. In the next one hour presidential history, for generations, the White Spring Resort has been host to America's most prestigious and discerning guests. Preeminent among them have been 31 sitting or former presidents of the United States, including Presidents Lincoln, Grant, and Roosevelt. With its idyllic mountain climate, restorative spring waters, fine sporting facilities, and cultured atmosphere, the White Spring has long been a favored vacation destination for Washington's elite. The resort's extensive conference facilities have also hosted innumerable political meetings and international summits. Well, if Washington's elite came here, I wonder if anyone from the government was here when the bombs dropped. We'll put a pin in that and save it for later. In the next one, self-guided tour, we find a bunch of options. We'll start with State Dining Room. The State Dining Room at the White Spring Presidential College has hosted more than a dozen formal banquets with heads of state. All of the furniture in this room is American-made, most dating to the 18th century. The most notable piece is the Mahogany Grand Cabinet, which displays the White Springs Presidential Platinum China. Ha! Huh. I wonder if there's any qualms with calling China China in the Fallout universe. I guess not. The display case in this room contains a saber carried by President Grant during the Vicksburg campaign, when his primary sword was lost at the Battle of Champion Hill and not recovered until the following day. A saber carried by President Grant during the Civil War? Wait a minute. <laughs> it looked like a Chinese officer's sword, not a saber. We'll have to take a closer look. In the next one, Hall of Heroes, the Hall of Heroes displays a fine collection of high-quality reproduction oil paintings commemorating America's Revolutionary War heroes. Take in the breathtaking view of the White Springs legendary golf course from the President's Portico on the rear of the house. The deck chairs on the portico were purchased from the White House in 2042 following renovations to the White House pool. In the next one, Social Parlor, when not enjoying activities elsewhere on the property, the first family often retires to the Social Parlor on the first floor. The the parlor features a comfortable space for casual discussions and evening entertainment, especially after a formal dinner. The grand piano in this room has been played by several notable pianists and innumerable presidential children. The cello, though once believed to be an original Stradivarius, was later determined to be a forgery, but remains with the house as an item of particular interest. Ah, uh, so we can't play a Stradivarius in the game. Oh well, at least we got the Swa Stradivarius in Fallout 3. 
Next, the presidential suite. Upstairs, the presidential suite provides an elegant respite for our distinguished guests. Notable pieces in this room include an antique television and phone from the Roosevelt White House, and a bureau that once belonged to President Millard Fillmore. Although originally a traditional four-poster, the 1887 mahogany bed was refashioned into a more modern design following damage during remodeling in 2054. Please do not sit, stand, sleep, or jump on the presidential bed. I see, so this explains why the bed we'll find doesn't look like a bed made in the 1800s. <laughs> That's a clever way to not have to create a new bed model for a presidential suite. And in the final one, children's suite. For decades, the children's suite has hosted the children and grandchildren of our presidents. Of particular note are toys donated by each of the children who have stayed in the cottage. Together, they represent different eras in American history, from an original 1903 teddy bear through icons of the mid-century space race to the modern Giddy Up Buttercup. The rather considerable wear on the antique furniture in this room is a testament to the many hours our young guests have enjoyed here. Convenient that the Bear, Rocket, and Giddy Up Buttercup just so happen to be the same toys we find all over the wasteland. Backing out of this, we can then go to Staff Access. Staff Access only. No unauthorized use permitted. Verifying credentials failed. A valid employee password is required for access. If you require assistance, please contact Resort Security Personnel. Hmm. So we need to gain employee access. And yeah, this doesn't look like a saber at all. It's a Chinese officer sword. What? They could have at least used a revolutionary sword. It at least has a passing resemblance. At any rate, we see the beautiful mahogany grand cabinet that the terminal was bragging about, but all of the china appears to be missing. So moving out a hole in the northeastern wall to a hallway, we can go out the back door. This just leads to a porch. Here we find a cam cooler. The hand scanner on the back door is again broken. Seems like a failed security measure if it can simply be broken to gain access to the door. Back inside, we can go down the hallway. There is a staircase leading upstairs. We'll head there in a minute. Moving on to the next room, it appears to be the social parlor mentioned in the terminal. We see chairs and a piano. And in the corner, we find a destroyed White Spring Docent Protectron. And on his wreckage is the Presidential Cottage Password. All right, I think that's what we need. Turning around, we can head back to the dining room, access the terminal, and this time when we choose staff access, we read verifying credentials done. Last security recording, September 14th, 2086. Again with that 2086. The logs at Riverside Manor all ended at 2086. The terminal here at Whitespring also ends in 2086. I wonder if it's just coincidence. We find a few options in the first display case access. We can open the display case. Then we find remote door control. Oh, looks like there's a door we can open, but checking it, multiple faults detected. Please check your door for any visible signs of damage. Contact maintenance at extension 91 for any necessary repairs. Oh, I see, this was for the front door with the hand scanner, but it's already broken. And in the last one, export security recording, 9-14-2086. Warning your security tape drive is full, please replace the security tape in order to resume normal monitoring. And with that, we get the Presidential Cottage Security Recording. Opening it up in our Pip-Boy. Brody. Hey. You're late. I know, I know. Sorry. This is Blackwater territory. We've had issues with them lately. Spare me. Any news? The last two raids have gone well. We lost a couple guys, but nothing like before. The boss said he'd take your deal. Finally. Honestly, I can't believe it. Babe, you and I are moving up in the world. Do you have the tape? Not yet. Found the program I need. Meet me here next week and I'll have it for you. Until then, I've got another ambush site picked out. You think you can do this? Uh, Lewisburg. Yeah, Carrie's gang is down that way. All right, I'll set it up. Anything else? No, we're good. See you next week. Idiot. Brody! And young woman? 
the security system here at the presidential cottage managed to record Raider boss Brody organizing the assassination of Natasha Hunt in Lewisburg. So that's how he knew she was going to be there. He was given a tip by a young woman. Does that mean the mistresses of mystery have a traitor in their ranks? But who could it be? We've heard a lot of voices so far, but I can't quite pin that voice down. The subtitles didn't give it away. Who was it that Brody was talking to? Sounds like whomever she is, Brody's gonna have to watch his back. She didn't appear to have much respect for the Raider boss. Perhaps she's just using him. But the display case is open, and we can loot Grant's... saber? We now have to attach a swing analyzer to Grant's saber from any weapons workbench. But before we do, I want to fully explore this presidential cottage to make sure we don't miss anything. On this bottom floor, we can kill a couple more ghouls, all of whom are dressed in their finest. Golf shirts and baseball caps. Clearly, they were patrons of the hotel. Heading upstairs, we find the bedrooms turning left. This is the presidential suite with the antique TV and telephone. Looks like this is that presidential bed, and I take my words back. This appears to be a brand new model. I don't remember it from Fallout 4. I wonder if we'll get access to it in our camp build menu. There are a couple of suitcases nearby that we can loot, both of which are locked. We'll have to pick them. And there's a first aid kit on the mattress next to a skeleton who was enjoying Medex and Buff Out before he died. After looting the chems and some bobby pins on a nearby table, we can loot even more Medex lying on the ground near to his his head in a trash can and a purified water on a side table. Then we can open a door to the bathroom, more chems in the mirror, and scrap in the dirty clothes bin. That's it for the master bedroom. Heading out, we can open the door to the northeast. Here we have to kill a ghoul, which is disturbing because this was the kids' room. Here we can loot a giddy-up buttercup, just like we read about on the terminal, loot a footlocker, and a bunch of other toys we are familiar with. Though we do find a bumble bear on a couch. Not sure how rare this is. It's the only one I've found. And the medicine bobblehead. The smart man knows a bandage only hides his wounds. When used, heal 30% more with stim packs for one hour. There are a couple of unique framed paintings on the walls. Looks like they were made by kids. And then we can open the bathroom door where we eerily find a skeleton in the shower with a stealth boy in the kid's bedroom. Okay, creepy. At his foot is the presidential cottage password. This appears to be the same password we found on the Protectron's wreckage. I guess it's just here in case we couldn't find the other. After looting the bobby pins in a garbage can and the chems from the mirror, we can head back to the hallway to open the door at the southern end. This leads to another patio where we find scrap and boxed foods. So that does it for the Presidential Cottage and Museum. As we were enjoying the plaque outside, we found a ghoul presenting himself. Let's take care of that. Before continuing on, I want to explore the rest of these luxury White Springs cottages. We see a storage area beneath the stairs. Hopping on in, we find a few sacks to loot and a big wheelbarrow full of fertilizer. Back on the walking path, we can move to the next cottage. After looting a bobby pin box, we see that the hand scanners are still functional, preventing us from entering these cottages. Well, wait a minute, this resort was for the rich and powerful of the U.S. government. And here, we find these private cottages still locked? So no one has been in here for 25 years since the bombs dropped? What is on the other side of these doors? Maybe they're just empty, or maybe the residents are still there. Moving down, we find that the third one has been shattered open. If it's so easy to shatter these hand scanners, I wonder why the other two haven't been destroyed yet. Heading inside, we find the occupants. We can loot a skill level 2 locked suitcase on the bed. And moving to the coat closet, we find a bunch of scrap, a bowler hat, and a skill level 2 locked floor safe. In the bathroom, we can loot chems in the mirror. Moving out and down to the other cottages, we find a similar scene. Plenty of scrap food and junk outside, but 
the hand scanners outside the doors are all active, and the doors are all locked. Now, at this point, I was pretty encumbered. I couldn't fast travel back to Riverside Manor, so taking the road east from here, we can try to find a workbench. It just so happened that the big green brick building leads to the White Springs Fire Service. We see a big truck parked and a friendly fire service protectron. Here we also find a power armor workbench, an armor workbench, a weapons workbench, and a tinkerer's workbench. Now, one of our steps is to attach the swing analyzer to the sword, and we could have done that from the weapons workbench here, but I kind I forgot about it. The fire station garage has a lot of wonderful scrap. We even find a gas mask in one of the lockers and a wooden crate filled with scrap. Moving into the office, we can open a northwestern door to a bathroom with chems in the mirror and moving east leads to a break room complete with a bed and a foot locker. That's it for White Springs for now. We will of course explore the entire place in upcoming videos, but for now, we must continue with our current quest. Back at camp, we can use any weapons workbench to attach the swing analyzer to the sword. From the modify menu in the crafting bench, we press space to modify, and then in the mod slot, select the swing analyzer we created using the fabricator back at Riverside. With the sword modified, we now have to kill six different type of creatures so we can get it calibrated. This is fairly easy to do. I got lucky in that I got attacked by Scorched right after leaving my shack. That counted for creature number one. I went off to do another quest while I was working on this one. Now I really wanted a death claw to be one of the enemies I killed to calibrate this thing, so heading back to White Springs, we can reliably find one death claw walking around near the pool. I took it down with my black powder rifle, then my shotgun, and finished it off last hit with Grant's saber. and that counted as creature number two. Then I got randomly attacked by mole rats, which counted for creature number three, then by ticks, creature number four, vicious wolves for creature number five, and it was here that I stumbled upon a Mr. Prize bot. What a day it's been, but I fight Congratulations! You are a winner of the great Appalachian sweepstakes. I have been authorized to deliver your prize winnings. We at the Great Appalachian Sweepstakes appreciate your continued purchases and subscriptions. However, we would like to remind you that your bill in the amount of $73,428.66 is overdue, and prompt payment is appreciated. Have a great day! Congratulations! This is a random encounter, and you only get this if you listen to the hollow tape in the trash bin at Orwell Orchards. I already did a video on Orwell Orchards, but I didn't know this random encounter occurred at the time of the video. By looting the hollow tape, the Mr. Prize bot thinks that we were the winners of the pre-war lottery. And this isn't a one-time random encounter. He'll stop by every now and then and just give us 100 pre-war money. But I had one more creature to kill, and I got number six by stumbling upon a feral ghoul. With the sword fully calibrated, we can head back to Riverside Manor to use the fabricator to craft the Blade of Bastet. With that, we complete Forging the Legend, and we receive the finished blade. Like the Garb of Mysteries, the Blade of Bastet is a level 25 item. When we get it, it does a base damage of 53, has a medium speed, and includes increased armor penetration. Like the Garb of Mysteries, we counterintuitively don't upgrade it through the Modify dialog of a workbench, but instead have to go to the Craft dialog. We can then create higher level versions of the Blade of Bastet as we level up, but unlike the Garb of Mysteries, we can only level it up in increments of 10 instead of 5. But it does go up 10 whole damage every 10 levels instead of 5. At level 45, this medium speed weapon does 86 damage, which is pretty great. I have to say I am disappointed in the way it looks. For a blade named after Bastet, the Egyptian goddess of women's secrets, forged from a saber used by General Grant during the Civil War. It it just looks like a Chinese officer's sword. A little disappointing and a bit of a missed opportunity there, I think. 
but there's no denying that it's effective in combat. Here I am using the level 25 version of the blade, and it's cutting through super mutants like a hot knife through butter. Now, we have a final task. Logging into the Cryptos mission board, we can select the Voice of Set. This gives us a holotape where we can receive our instructions from Shannon Rivers. The Mistress of Mystery is not a sniper. She is not the Silver Shroud, leaping into the fray with his silver submachine gun blazing. But she does carry a pistol. It is a tool, like any other, to be used when the situation requires it. The mistress's iconic revolver was the voice of Set. It had a variety of powers. To be frank, it did whatever the writers needed it to do. I received more than a few letters about that. Probably from Ken. But for us, that variety is essential. We need tools capable of meeting any challenge. Your mission is to help expand our options. Cryptos has leads on a number of prototype weapons that were in development before the war. You will be assigned to retrieve one of them. Bring the plans to Frederick and see what he can make of it. He never fails to amaze me. All right, so in order to make the voice of Set, we have to find a pre-war prototype weapon. Let's see what Kryptos has for us. Logging in, we can navigate to database queries and then search for weapons research. Kryptos discovers pre-war military records that indicate that an EMP weapons research program was being conducted at Sugar Grove. Please acquire the research data and return it to the production facility for processing. Okay, so it looks like whatever weapon we're about to craft is going to be dealing electromagnetic damage. So, sounds like this is going to be a great tool for fighting robots. We now must travel to Sugar Grove to discover the weapons research program the pre-war American military was working on. But Sugar Grove is a fascinating, sprawling pre-war military espionage installation. There's just too much lore there for me to cover in today's episode. And so we'll cover Sugar Grove in my next episode. And you don't want to miss it. Because in the ruins of Sugar Grove, we discover one of the darkest, most twisted experiments the United States military ever undertook. I publish many Fallout videos each and every week here on my channel, so if you don't want to miss my next one, be sure to subscribe and to click that bell notification button. I have a shirt shop with completely unique designs you can't find anywhere else. My designs come on shirts in a variety of sizes and in a wide array of colors. They also come on other products as well, like smartphone cases, stickers, mugs, pillows, posters, prints, etc. So if interested, you can find a link to my shop in the description below, or you can click here. If you like what I do and you want to support me in a more personal way, consider Consider becoming one of my patrons on Patreon or a member here on YouTube. But more than anything, I'm just so glad you're here watching this video with me today. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you soon with more brand new videos.